All right, we are live. Okay. So um, I usually just wait for a few minutes until somebody starts to show up. We had a pretty good turnout. Um, we had uh, so 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 far. I think that the post has reached about seventeen thousand people. Um, and all right, we've got somebody on. All right, great for the things with the thumbs up. All right, let's go. So uh, hi everybody. Today I am here with uh, Dr. Ron Hutchison uh, from Stockton University, uh, associate professor um, in sustainability and in biology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm going to let him introduce himself and talk a little bit about. Uh, his position, what he does at Stockton, and keep it brief, we're going to go for a tour around the farm. Great. So uh, I'm going to uh, take my mask off now, um, but we are at the, so I can project, we're at the Stockton Sustainability Farm. So this is a, um, within the fence here is about 1.1 acres of planted area, and we are modeling uh, sustainable agricultural uh, techniques for the agroecology uh, program. And uh, Agroecology is a bit of a, a weird bird in the uh, scientific field. It, um, it contains both a, um, a research component, an applied component, so those are much like agronomy and other aspects of agricultural research, but it also contains a social justice uh, component due to the fact that it sort of arose out of, um, out of indigenous um, agricultural practices in uh, North, South, and Central America. And so it has that component in it as well. So it's kind of interesting. We're, we both worry about the, uh, the ecological system that we're working in and try to main, maintain that uh, in a working functional system. And we worry about uh, things like the food system and how food gets delivered to people and how farm workers are treated. So we're both at the same time cognizant of, of our research principles and cognizant of how that goes and we're also worried about, say, how our workers are treated and how, how we treat our, our students. So, so we have that part of it, which is a little bit different than, than some of other, other aspects of uh, So you're kind of you're kind of looking at this from both the both the ecosystem, the environment end, as well as from the human end, yeah, trying to make them it, meet in the middle. Yeah, and kind of and kind of get that to work. So it's a really interesting um, it's a really interesting field to be in. It actually fits with a liberal arts education just to a T because it requires you to 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 understand you know some social science stuff as well so it's it it really I think it really fits well at a at a place like Stockton. So what kind of classes do you teach at Stockton just to give us yeah. a, uh, an idea for who you are? So I teach plant physiology that's my training I was uh, trained as my PhD is in plant physiology from a large you know research university in the Midwest University of Illinois um, I taught that at Stockton for the last 15 years uh, and uh, wait were you born in Illinois? Uh, Ohio you're from Ohio? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. We can't be friends anymore. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Let's go on. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, so plant physiology? Plant physiology first. Then uh, about five years ago, I was teaching a plant physiology class, and a student was really excited to take it, which is always uh, a good thing. Uh, not always doesn't always happen. And uh, she dropped the class after uh, three weeks. Did a great job on the first exam, uh, four weeks maybe. Did a great job on the first exam. She was like, no, I really just wanted to learn how to grow plants and how to farm. And I was like, wow, this is great. And so, so I started teaching, uh, um, I started shifting my research more to plant focus uh, and more whole plant level. Um, we, I teach a class now called uh, Plants and um, uh, Agroecology, uh, which basically talks about things from the sort of organismal level to the plants up to the community level. Uh, and then I also teach a course from, called Food and Agriculture that again talks about more the nuts and bolts about, um, about small scale sustainable ag and then also talks about our uh, food justice, our food system, and things like that. So That's those great. are the two classes, three classes I teach that are in my uh, area. I also teach biology, sustainability, and then uh, I also teach an energy management class in sustainability. I didn't know you were in the energy. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so he's a... Um, so if you, if you are interested in Stockton, if you're interested in sustainability, in case you're wondering, we, had, um, uh, we have two tracks, essentially. We have agriculture, we have energy, and uh, Dr. Patrick Hasse, who was on a previous live stream with me uh, a couple weeks ago, you can watch his video, heads up a lot of the energy curriculum, and Dr. Hutchison here heads up a lot of the agricultural curriculum. curriculum. All right, so enough of that. Let's, uh, let's go on a tour. Before yeah, we, as we're walking, let's, um, 
let me just say that uh, uh, um, I don't have the gimbal as I did last week, and also I finally figured out why I couldn't see the comments on the videos from last time. It's just a matter of swiping to the left to see them, so I can see them all now. If anybody has any comments or questions, um, interested in anything, wants us to show you anything, please just ask, um, and I will uh, let Dr. Hutchison know, and uh, we'll answer them right away. All right, cool. So we'll stop here first, and then if you can sort of pan around this, this area here. So this is the, uh, this area here is what we call the market garden. So if you'll notice here, like there's four beds here in black plastic. Uh, there's four beds here in lettuce. There are uh, four beds here that are in beets that were uh, a few weeks ago in garlic. Um, four beds of zucchini. So each of these plots represents maybe a farm uh, or maybe if you had a large scale farm, this might represent the rotation you would have on your farm. So it's a very strict rotation. Uh, it's a, every year we move the bed one, four beds counter, or four beds clockwise. So if you came back 10 years from now, this is roughly what would be planted. And in the meantime, every year we would move, rotate through there. So this gives the students, it's a very teachable, um, teachable area of the farm. And, and, it, and in fact, in these uh, 40 beds here, these are the only areas that we have uh, a real strict rotation. And rotation, uh, for those of you who don't know, is, is really important in agriculture because there might be, say, certain diseases, uh, like if we look over here at our onions, uh, there might be certain diseases that are present in alliums uh, that we can then, uh, the, the allium diseases that might build up over the summer will be hopefully gone by the time the garlic rotates into that six years later. And by the time, if there's any allium diseases in the garlic, uh, four years later when the onions rotate there, hopefully they'll be gone by then. Yeah, so guys, crop rotation is, is a pretty, I mean, it's really common. The only time when we don't see it is really on these large agribusinesses because um, they just want one single product from year to year and to get that they have to spend a lot of money on fertilizer and it's definitely not the most sustainable yes. practice. So as most uh, responsible farmers will tell you crop rotation is so important for the reasons yeah. that uh, that Ron is saying right now. Yeah, yeah it's not yet. Yeah, disease is one of them. There's a there's a number of other benefits that, that uh, below yeah. ground root competition nutrients. Yeah, exactly and uh, and we also do some uh, we also, all, within each of those beds, we also have rotations that are in there. So let's take a look at the onions here, for example. Uh, so, uh, so Rob and I, our farm manager, harvested this bed here that's, uh, that's uh, the second bed in. And you can see that we planted over here. These are new onions that are going in. So we, we got, uh, I think, 200 and something pounds of onions from this 60-foot bed. Uh, and... Uh, and we'll replant this, and as we harvest along this, there'll be another batch of onions that are going in, and that will continue throughout the season, keeping in mind that it won't see alliums again until the garlic show up here roughly six years from now. So, so within each bed, we're moving. Uh, if we move over here to the radishes, and uh, we've also designed these rotations uh, based on um, the book by Jean Martin Fortier that we use in class called The Market Gardener. And so he uh, has, a, he's the one that really came up with this real strict rotation. And we follow that because we use that book in our class. Is that a, is that a historical book? No, it's actually relatively recent. Okay. And, uh, and he is, one of the cool things about the agroecology movement is it was, it is, uh, it is people focused. So there's people doing great work in this field that are non-academics. Uh, and so some of the some of the real giants early on. You mean like farmers? Yeah, farmers themselves. And farmers what, are some of the best scientists in the entire world. They, man. man, they know how to collect data, analyze data, and pick what works. And so just just so the audience knows, because we're we're both ecologists, biologists here. Ecology was really born out of agriculture. Most of the early ecologists were agricultural scientists, and most of the early eco ecological studies were from agriculture, like how to produce the most amount, because that was the applied science. Nowadays, we've gotten a little bit farther away, but still, some of the best science comes from farmers. Yeah, it's really interesting. The history of it is just fascinating. Um, if, if you want to delve into that, it's worth looking at. But 
We will put a link for the book after yeah. the video's over. I'll put a sure, link for the yeah, book. Sure, yeah, that, that'd be great. But the, uh, the, the thing was that there was really, uh, they really sort of went hand in hand. And at various times in history, the competition between the pure ecologists, if I want to say it that, but I don't really want to call it that, and the, agri the agronomy part of it got pretty intense uh, roughly in the 40s after the introduction of, of you know, big agribusness chemicals. Yeah, and, and like then that. Pest, so yeah, pesticides. Pesticides, and it's, it, uh, but it's, um, but, you know, fortunately nowadays it's, it's really getting back in the swing of things. All right, so we've got onions, we've got radishes. Yeah, so these are radishes. This is the, this is the third uh, planting of radishes, and we have lettuces here. Third planting of radishes this season. Yeah, we're getting, those are a 30 My day, goodness. the 30 day cycle, and so, um, so you can get, the other thing I want to point out, as you know, the reason why farming is so important is that uh, if you want to think about it, we farm a tremendous amount of the earth's surface, either by ranching or by, by you know, traditional row crop farming. Um, any productivity that we can have means that that land can be used for something else. Uh, in my book and probably in your book, it would be great if that land was used for, you know, wild areas, places to kayak you know, protected areas. And so we really have a, we have a, a mission really to not grow a few things on a little bit of land. That's an unsustainable global uh, system. We need to have, you know, even though we're doing this organically and, and certified naturally grown, we need to have yield as well, yeah. because that is that we need to teach our students. You gotta that feed people. You gotta feed people gotta and, feed you can't, people. and you can't waste land. All right. Well, let's let's keep let's a move on. Let's uh, because yeah, because I have the attention span of a fruit fly. Um, so we have we have those as pests too. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about pests in a little bit. By the oh, way, yeah. um, Tammy Miller just uh, said that's a cool mural. Um, yeah, let's stop here. Yeah, we can stop here and just talk sure. about the mural. A little blending of art and and uh, agriculture here. You'll have to excuse us, the military is doing some training around us, so the planes are in the background. It'll be a very, uh, very, um... Cyclic. Cyclic, uh, noise. Yeah. You always hear. So, uh, I'm gonna get pretty close here and, and point. Uh, so this mural was done by Vicki Saunders, who's a sustainability graduate, uh, uh, as of two months ago. Um, and this, uh, container is a, is a really sustainable way to have a barn if you're a small farm. Uh, you have, um... There. So this is just a shipping container, one shipping of those ones that you see on the coast of New Jersey, yep. up near uh, Trenton. It's yeah, it's just yep. a shipping container. Yeah, and so what we when it came here, it had a name, you know, it had the shipping company's name on it, and so uh, so Vicky wanted to do a project, and we were like, yeah, let's do it, and so she came up with this mural. Uh, we'll we'll see a little bit of the one on the other side. Well, um, I didn't know there was one on the other side. Yeah, there's one on the other mm -hmm. side. So just to keep with our um, our hippy dippy sort of vibe here, it's gonna say Flower Power runs the magic bus. That was the last bit before that was going to be completed before uh, COVID uh, hit. So, so we'll get into. We'll you get... are going to be permanently branded at the university if you write that on this. Oh, we're writing that on this. It's already outlined, so we got that part done. So on this side, guys, we have a uh, walk-in cooler. Talk. Yeah. Let's talk about like agroecology and sustainability here. We have a walk-in cooler that is powered by the sun. The sun. We've got so solar panels plants, on top. Yeah, our plants. Uh, are powered by the sun, and so is our uh, cooler here. I should let me step back a little bit and tell you about um, really the goals of our farm, which we probably won't we probably won't hit for a number of years. But our goal is to be is to really be sustainable, to be a hundred percent solar powered farm, um, off grid, so using our energy from the sun, uh, and to also uh, eventually get all our crops irrigated by rainwater. Uh, we have some rainwater collection system, but eventually we want to get there. So that way we're using the sunlight, we're using uh, rainwater, and we're growing food with minimal num minimal amounts of input. Nice. So uh, so let's take a look at our cooler here. Yeah, let's go in. Let's see what you got. So this is... Um... It smells garlicky. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, wait. Hang on. I got... Oh, is it the... Oh, it. I lost a connection. Yeah, I gotta keep okay. it open. Okay. Yeah, you want to step up? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I almost lost the connection there. Gotta, um, gotta move we'll on out. out. I'll, uh, I'll leave the door open and let the cool air out. Yeah, we're gonna cool yeah. the outdoors. We're gonna cool the outdoors. Yeah. So, uh, which I think you talked about two weeks ago. What Patrick told us not to do. We're, yeah. we're, 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 uh, we're cooling our house just like the Simpsons. Uh, we're cooling our farm. So what this is is um, there's a battery bank in the uh, in the um, in the first two thirds of the trailer. Uh, the solar panels charge that battery. 
during the day, we have enough output uh, from the panels to run this, and at night the battery kicks in and we, and we run down the battery. Even if we have multiple cloudy days in the row, there's enough uh, stored thermal mass in here where during the day it will cool down even in a, even in a slightly cloudy day uh, and still keep our temperature pretty, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Nice. Uh, and it's very simple. It's an air conditioning unit hooked it up to a device called a cool bot. Nice. And it basically tricks the air conditioner to turn this into a walk-in cooler. Interesting. Uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very. Easy. So not not extremely high tech. No, we try to. If there is a way to do something as low tech as possible, right. that's what we try to. So do. if anybody is a home gardener listening to this, um, you too can easily kind of work on such sustainability. I mean, if you have half an acre or an acre of land and you want to, I mean, this is how how large is this, is this plot of land right here? The area that we're going to travel with inside the fence is uh, 1.1 acres. Yeah, so guys, it's fence. just 1.1 acres and a lot of people, a lot of people probably watching this have that. And if you want to farm on your property sustainably, yeah. you know, just just think about the easy things that you can do. All right, let's take a walk. Yeah, let's go. So um so that is the tight rotation here. Outside of that market, what we call the market garden, we have a more uh, uh, larger plots of single crops. So for example, this is all sweet potatoes, a very high yielding crop, very popular uh, with, with people, uh, especially the nice thing is this will be ready for harvest around Thanksgiving. Uh, and so the perfect timing for, uh, for your festivities uh, that time of year. Uh, pretty high yield too. We have potatoes over here, and I want to talk a little bit about insects as well. So, uh, and I'm, I'm not shy about showing our mistakes as well. So these are uh, Colorado potato beetles here. Uh, and they have, have nearly uh, denuded this plant. There's a few, the leaf area is pretty minimal on this plant. Now, I just want to point out, those are beetles. Mm -hmm. They're larvae. They are, yes. Yeah. The beetles are... All right, uh, so for anybody that's curious, this is the beetle larvae. Yeah. It will transform into what we know of as a beetle. We will take a look and try to find one. Um, I don't see one here. They're, the adults are around. Um, they might be... Oh, let me I dig around. Zoom in. It's a little yeah. hard to zoom in here. So they uh, just decimate this plant. Yeah, and uh, and we do have... we You know, we don't... Um, we, we use um, organic certified through an agency called the OMRI, the Organic Certifying Agency. So we only use things that are uh, sprays that are certified by them. And what we typically use is a tropical oil called neem oil. Um, and I've seen that stuff in toothpaste. Yeah. Um, apparently, it's you know it's used in a lot of different things. Yeah, but, it's uh, useful. It's, so what um, do you do? You spray it on these plants? We spray it, and it doesn't do a very good job. <laughs> you know what you you know what you need. What? You need Chrissy Sharer. Yeah. Yeah, she's really good at killing that's, pests. Um, so that's... Have you seen her greenhouse? That's... So that was the last live stream. She's yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah, that's where we got the neem oil from, but don't tell Chris. Oh, okay. So, so, <laughs> it's, from, it's from her cabinet. Got so, it, got it. Yeah, so... Um, oh, boy, now I'm, in, now I'm in trouble. Now she's on here, so... Yeah, that's right, I'm in trouble. But the... Um, so what do you do when this happens? Well, like, what, strangely, this happened last year. So what, what we thought this year was we spent an inordinate amount of time early in the season... Uh, destroying eggs and picking uh, larvae off okay. um, and it still didn't work so what we're going to do now is use our brains and skip a year so the adults we, we again we take a look at uh, ecological principles the adults overwinter in the ground they come up they walk they need to walk to find a meal so next year if we skip potatoes uh, and we do our uh, and we keep our other solanaceous crops in the greenhouse then uh, we can we can eliminate the food source for the next year, and then hopefully the following year we'll have less predation, and we can get on top of it. So, so just that's using a great using ecology, the, using, the ecology part of agroecology. Yes, and you, it's I am shocked at how often when you think of a problem in terms of an of an evolutionary or ecological thought process how the solution just jumps out at well, you. You just listen to nature. Yeah, there you go. So I'm preaching to the choir here. So <laughs> preaching to the guy holding the camera. Um, and again, over there we have... Uh, well, more... people don't... I mean, a lot of people can't afford to lose a crop in one year. Well, the, honestly, the thing about this is we will... The potato is such a... We will lose, I don't know, maybe, maybe 
10, 20 percent of our harvest, which, okay. is, which on a monoculture, if you're trying to, if you're a farmer and you're trying to put your, say, your kids through college, that's a lot. And you've got a one percent yield loss, that's devastating. Right. But if you have a multi-species, uh, robust ecological system, something else is most likely going to do better, and and that's going to be the thing that's going to, you know, allow you to succeed. Right. Um, uh, Ron, Chrissy says you can use as much as you want. Just let her know when you're down to one bottle. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. That's great. So cool. we've so we've got potato beetles, but we've also got a lot of potatoes. And sustainably, we can yeah. use ecology to manage this so that we yeah. don't have to use harsh pesticides. Maybe exactly. cut it down a little bit with some neem oil. Yep. If you're a home gardener, too, part of being sustainable, especially in part of being organic, is that you have to be involved with your plants. You can't just set it and forget it. You really have to go out there and work with your plants. Now, you're not gonna be able to pick every single one of these things off, Yeah. but at least you can help the plants. Well, I can also give you two, uh, two stories about that. So number one, I'm growing, I'm growing 100 pounds of potatoes at home in my backyard. I don't have a single Colorado potato beetle. It's not that I've done anything right. They're just not there. Um, Rob, our farm manager, who we'll, who we'll meet in a second, hopefully, um, is uh, at his farm had a potato beetle problem, and he really did work on it, and now they have almost no problem. So they, you know, they went and picked and squashed and uh, and got rid of the bugs. The scientific and, term is squished. 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 All right, good. Um, and so, so there are ways you might you might have one insect pest or weed pest at your place that we don't have here, and we may have one that's awful, and you don't have it at home. So let's keep on walking. Yeah, what else moving. we got? So this is a, uh, this right here is a mixed uh, wildflower uh, perennial bed here. This provides a home for some of our insects that are hopefully gonna, gonna attack uh, our, our crops. So we have some, these are mostly herbaceous. We're gonna mix in some woody perennials as well. Uh, to give habitat. So when you go look at those Colorado potato beetles, you'll notice every so often a ladybug larva going after uh, some of them. A FYI, lady a ladybug larvae looks nothing like a ladybug. Yeah, it's yeah, it's bizarre. And the adults will the adults will eat the eggs, I think. Don't quote me on that, but uh, but they're also beneficial as well. So Eww. providing habitat for that is a good thing. And we can make tea out of this. Uh, with yarrow, it has you know beneficial uh, that that large thing that's flowering now is a is a mallow, uh, a marshmallow. Um, so you know, can you we, make marshmallows? You know, I I don't think so, but <sighs> you, you, I think it's in the roots too. So there's probably a way to do it. I don't know. Um, so this is our brassica field here. So these are all brassicas. They're under row cover to. Um, For those of you that don't know what brassica is, it's broccoli cauliflower, kale. kale. Uh, FYI, all of those come from the same plant. Yeah, we have just selected them. We humans, let's go look at a kohlrabi. Yeah, oh, this is something that like, whenever, oh. I, tell, whenever I tell my, my, my students that they're all from the same plant, it just like blows their mind. Your, your, your kohlrabi, your kale, your Brussels sprouts, your broccoli, all the same plant. We've just selected them. So if you look at this here, oh, I smell it. Yeah, you can you can smell that brassica smell. But if you look at this, this is a kohlrabi here. That leaf looks like that. You know, I mean, that might be a collard leaf. You know, if you if it was Same laying on the if it was laying on the ground, you might say, oh, it's a collard leaf. But it's attached to this giant bulb that humans have selected for a huge you know, basically modified stem. Right, so it's the same species, just a, a modified variety of it. Yeah, and you can eat the greens in these too. This is a wonderful thing. A lot of um, Eastern European uh, countries and cultures uh, really, really like the, uh, the kohlrabi. Smells. Oh, just... Uh, I love that smell. Yeah, it's fun, it's fun growing these things. Uh, and then you look over here, here's some Napa cabbage. So, uh, you gotta speak up. Find a, Whenever you turn away from the camera, just remember that it's harder to hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's a, here's a knot of cabbage here. So you have this, usually we'd use a knife to harvest this, but this one's got a little bit of damage in it. Um, but let's get down to the good stuff here. Peel this back. By the way, he's, he's, uh, he's definitely killing the plant right now. However, yes. it's not gonna go to waste. Actually, and you can for some of them, 
if you treat this more gently than I'm treating it, you really need a knife for this, um, it will actually re-sprout. I'll see if I can find one. It'll re-sprout mini cabbages. There's dirt on that plant. Yeah, that's all right. That's gross. Oh, no. You just wash it off. But no. there's a nice Napa cabbage. So that's, I, if, you can't really feel it, but the, you want to you feel that? That's a, that's a couple pounds right oh, there. Oh, Jesus, this is heavy. Yeah, it's dense. That's a lot of, lot of nutrition right in there. So between that and this, um, you've got a lot of, lot of stuff. So this is looking pretty good. It looks like you have a little bit of browning on the edges. Is that yeah, from a pest? Uh, yeah, and some of them have, have failed as well. So here's some that are, no, that's a, so here's some that are re-sprouting here. So this was harvested uh, probably a week ago. And those will make little, uh, little cabbageettes. Sure. I don't know what the technical term is. But you can harvest those as well and eat them too, so. And you know, it, it, I don't. I noticed that you're not taking a huge amount of effort to clear off every little bit of dead plant material, no. and that's another important thing. You know, if you are overly monitoring your garden, you can harm it because a lot of this plant material that's on the ground that's dead is actually insulating the base of the plant. It's acting as mulch. It's also going to decompose and add nutrients to the ground. So you don't need to just like swipe away every single bit of dead plant material. Man, you're great. You want me to hold the camera for a bit? I think we can switch. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and the other thing that I'll point out too is what we try to do is uh, we plant much closer density than it would say maybe on the seed packet or in a commercial. We're not using uh, any weed that shows up. We have to get rid of that either with a tool or by ourselves. So what we do is we plant close together so that the leaves start touching and shading out the understory here. So there's not a weed, there's not a weed underneath there because there can't, the light can't get into that. So that's another sort of ecological principle. Three sisters. Oh. The three sisters method of planting. All right, we'll get there in a sec. Squash, <laughs> bean, and what was the, what's the third one? Corn. Corn. corn Squash, bean, bean and corn. corn. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we do that as well. Uh, and that's, that's one of those traditional, that was an agroecological concept that is employed nowadays that has been around for i have no idea how long but uh thousands. at least a thousand thousands years. yeah yep so uh and then you look here these are different kinds so we try to get some variety these are nice tight small oh, cabbage here um you'll notice we're uh we are standing on wood chips uh and and we also use mushroom compost so we have increased this the carbon do you make mushrooms we do some mushrooms, but nice. we mostly do the compost. We get the compost from Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Really? Um, yeah. And there's our, there's, you wanna, there's the groundhog right there digging up our subsoil. So that's what our subsoil Stupid looks like. Stupid groundhog. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So FYI, um, I know that we have a lot of people on. This is great. Thank you guys so much for joining. We're here at the sustainability farm with Dr. Ron Hutchison, who is um, Associate Professor of Sustainability and Biology at Stockton University. If anybody has any questions, comments, if you want to, uh, if you want to correct us on anything, we are scientists, which means that we're just stupid enough to get up in front of a class and teach students what we think we know, but we're smart enough to recognize that we don't know that much. And if you were here for the beginning part, I also pointed out that the that, that the citizen. Uh, movement in in farming is is alive and well and strong. So. And so anybody that that wants you, advice, questions, uh, I know that Ron will be happy to to answer yep. them. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I finally figured it out. For those of you who've been watching my live streams, how to actually see the comments. So what are we staring at now? This is um this is a great this is uh the in the rotation here. This is our winter squash area. So we have pumpkins, delicata squash, uh, things like that. And so we have some heirloom varieties. At the end there is a pumpkin called Long Island Cheese Pumpkin. It looks like a wheel of cheese when it's harvested. Uh, and then we have modern hybrids mixed in here too because they're high yielding, disease resistant um, seeds. We're, uh, we're certified naturally grown. So we have a, uh, a mandate or our certifying agent wants to see 70% of our seeds uh, come from organic sources, but we have the option of trialing things, seeds that are non-organic. The idea being is that that 70% number uh, drives the organic seed production, but that 30% allows for farmers to clamor for more organic seeds. So it's a really nice uh, 
So Push those of you that are, are curious, there's, um, we often say, because when you go to the grocery store, you see organic versus non-organic produce. But in reality, how many different types of organic certifications are there? Uh, it, yeah, there's different certifying agencies. So there's USDA organic uh, that you meet the USDA uh, guidelines, but then there's also certifying agents in each uh, region or state or something like that. So Pennsylvania has their, their certifying agent, Bay State Organics will certify in the sort of the Northeast. Um, and so different uh, agencies will certify yeah. to that organic standard. We're also certified naturally grown, which is a different, uh, slightly different sort of standard than organic uh, standards. Uh, and we, that's, that's the method that we follow. It's a peer to peer farm certification. Lori Ann asks, when you say market farm, do you participate in the Galloway green market? We are, um, uh, we have, since its inception, we have participated in the Galloway Green Market. As of now, we have zero students on campus. <laughs> so it's basically Rob, the farm manager, and I running this by ourselves, and we are swamped. And so, so, yes, but not right now. But not right now. If students are allowed to come back, we're going to do, we're going to, uh, we've talked to the people in charge, and we will, we would love to do it as a pop-up, but we can't, we can't, we don't have enough a person power to do sure. two markets uh, and I, I feel awful about it but it is what it is right now i know it's just a let's weird uh time. let's walk let's back the... towards there so you can drop the oh okay yeah, or we can just drop those off i know they're heavy I'll drop them off here, yeah. you can only um, hold something for so long by the way uh somebody just commented to me uh that they were not sure well they didn't comment on the stream they sent me a text that they weren't sure on how to post a comment um, you should just be able to either swipe on a phone to post a comment or uh, look at it. On, if you're on your computer screen, there should be a bar on the side to post a comment. So as we're, as we're walking here, yeah. uh, this is... Uh, Herbs! Yeah, two different varieties of parsley here. Oh, uh, large leaf my Italian. favorite and, uh, parsley. Oh, it's, it's such a... Just run your hands and then you can see. Oh, I, I wish we had it. smell on the phone because it's So you have Italian and Yeah, this is the large leaf here, and then yeah. this is the the you know sort of frilly stuff you get on the Stupid side. Stupid masks. I'm wearing a mask, guys, just in case you're curious. Well, I'm us, wearing them. Yeah, one of us needs One of us has gotta be wearing a mask. Um I can't smell anything through the mask. Uh cilantro dill. Cilantro. More kales over there as part of that rotation. Now, can oh. you use cilantro and kale as like buffer crops between plants to ward off some insects? Um, you can. Does that work? Um, we, uh, yeah, we we don't typically do that, but you okay. can do that kind of thing. At the Stockton farm, we have seen someone said, "Oh, plant, uh, you know, plant stuff in your garlic, and and the animals won't love it." We, mm. I've seen rabbits go after stuff in right next to the garlic plant and just <laughs> denude the. They don't the, care. The, they don't care. They. They're hungry. They're for this. Uh, it looks like we got some tomatoes. We got some green tomatoes here. A little bit of red ones over Keeping here. Keeping the wildflowers growing. Uh, yeah, those are um, poppies that have been uh, growing for the past uh, two years. I think we planted them last, uh, well, year about a year and a half. So we we overwintered them in the greenhouse, and they came back, and it was a neat little experiment. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have different really varieties nice. here. We have our two cherry varieties over here, um, and then these are. Uh, different varieties and again we have some heirloom varieties but some we want yield we want yield on so okay. and, and good taste and disease resistance so we have a uh, one of our real favorite ones in there is a variety called bee orange it's not orange now it's bee green orange bee orange yeah it's a french uh french sounds swedish like bjorn yeah yeah there you go um but you can see where we got a you know we not too long we'll be ripening up and getting some some uh, tomatoes. Yeah, it looks here. like maybe another couple weeks. A little bit on the trellising. This is uh, again our farm manager Rob is great on this. So let me show this part here. Now I was also talking with Rob about how to construct one of these hoop houses. Uh, so this is a fairly large one. I'm guessing it's about 30 feet. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a 30 feet hoop house like all the materials for what yeah. maybe six thousand yeah. but i mean this is that's for a large hoop house you're producing a lot if you want something smaller it's you can get one very, for pretty cheap very doable very if you're doable. handy you can build it yourself for a lot cheaper or if you want to buy one prefab yeah, yeah. the other thing too is uh, the, all the greenhouses that you see on camp on the farm here on campus were built by students oh so that's part awesome. of our that's our mission you were saying something about the trellises yeah trellising system this is a double leader here so there's one root where my foot is and it goes up into two tops here 
so uh, so we can get uh, twice as much uh, fruit or you know uh, flower clusters as we would if you were going up for a sim single stem. Why do so, you still have everything on the spools up there? We have some on the spools. Uh, we actually, I think, are going to give up on the spools next next year, maybe. So just, just to keep tension. Yeah. So sometimes they we get so much weight on these that they will sometimes pull Sag. down. Sag. Yeah. But what what the spools allow us to do is uh, it does form a very uh, nice system. It's called a lower and lean system. So what you can do is we can grow these up to the top, and then we can shift everything down two feet and let out two feet of string and trellis up two more feet. Um, and so eventually you end up with a long stem at the bottom and then a harvestable tomato going up. Nice. So it's a way to increase production over the course of the season, allow ease of harvest. Let me tell you a little bit, because we're so into rotations, let me tell you a little bit about this greenhouse too. Um, this is not always here. And what I mean by that is if you look at each of the feet here, it's on a roller system. So this greenhouse is actually part of a three bed rotation. This greenhouse can be moved by two students pushing it. This entire structure can be moved by just two humans uh, pushing it. So I can attest to that. I was one of those yeah, two, well, you two, year, two years ago. Nice. Oh, excellent. So what, what we can do is we can set up a rotation where this year the tomatoes are here. Last year the tomatoes were where the, um, uh, where the alliums were. And two years ago it's where the carrots and what will soon be spinning. Right, are. so you guys can see how you can just, we can just roll this straight down. And what it allows us to do is harvest throughout 365 days. So let's say in the fall we want to maximize our tomato production. We're still harvesting in October. Um, and yet we've started spinach out here. And so what we'll do is then at the end of October, we get a real hard frost, it kills off our tomatoes. We get students out, we, we unhook this, we move it over and we get the spinach into production. Right, so you know how like they say you have to take plants in during the winter or you have to take, you know, you have to put plants in the shade during a particular type of year. They don't put the plants in the shade, they create the weather conditions for the plants we, by doing this. And we can, we can increase yields dramatically by having plants growing in their optimal conditions throughout the season. Nice. So we can, so for example, let's go through the winter. We might put it on alliums and kales in the winter, and then we might go back uh, in early spring and move it to that last plot down there, uh, close up the greenhouse, warm up that soil on that sunny March day, and get our tomatoes in, uh, get that soil warmed up and get our tomatoes in early so we can be uh, you know, ready to go for the markets in the next nice. year. Nice. So that's a little trick. Yvonne asks, how do you get rid of caterpillars? She has a ton in her kale plant. Oh no. I wonder if they're, um, I wonder if they're cabbage moth, uh, caterpillars. Uh, do you see any white, white? Yvonne, why don't you send a, p oh ma'am. Isn't that, that's, tastes uh, delicious. that's a variety called Sakura. It's a Japanese, oh, uh, it's good. uh, only two things that money can't buy, and that's homegrown. It's true love and homegrown tomatoes. Oh, I like. I'm gonna steal that. Yeah. Thank you. It's I, well, I just stole it from a guy Clark song. So. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit about some of the. So we're also obviously a research institution. So we're doing research. This is our garlic plot here. This is my favorite uh, part of it. So we have uh, 32 different varieties of garlic that we're trialing for our market garden approach, our intensive uh, market garden approach. And what we're uh, looking for is varieties that, uh, that we can suggest to local growers that will fit their needs. For example, if you look um, over here, there's garlic, but then that's not garlic, that's buckwheat. So the varieties that were where that buckwheat is, uh, we harvested super early. They mature early and if this were in the market garden, we could put in something like beets or a cash crop to follow it with. Um, but that early variety allows uh, people to eat fresh garlic much sooner in the season. And some of these other ones you'll notice are, um, are you know, well away from being harvested. Nice. So, and uh, th this year is particularly nice. We, we started trialing a new variety called Red Janus that is a very hot. Red Janus. Red Janus is the name. Named uh, after Janus. Joplin? I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. I'll look it up. 
the uh, but it's very hot, very spicy. And because our other early variety over there, which is early Portuguese, um, is uh, it's a very mild garlic, a nice nice uh, garlic to put in, you know, something that doesn't can't can't really be overpowered by the garlic. So now we can tell farmers, hey, if you want to get your garlic in and get it out and get it to market, these two varieties are really good. Go with them, right? And then then that frees you up for the rest of the summer. And you involve students in that research? Absolutely. They they are. I am so missing students right now. It's not even funny. It's uh, they. They, everything we do on the farm involves students. It is almost everything is a pedagogical, teachable thing. Yeah, in fact, I can attest to this on my own stuff. We're really struggling right now just because we're trying to do a little bit of research. We're trying, we're trying, we're uh, trying, but just everything about Stockton is the students. And we just, we, we, we need them back, but we gotta also be safe. Now I gotta tell you, Ron, mm -hmm. Maria Love, do you know do you know a Maria Love? No. Well, she asked, are you working with the Rutgers Hazelnut program? What? To bring oh. hazelnut growing to New Jersey. And Maria, the reason why I ask is because oh. we were just talking about that before. I looked at this unmowed patch. We are, and we will take a look at it as we walk back to yeah, the front. Give, give we are working, we'll, trying to bring Nutella. Oh, yeah. uh, Maria says, uh, <laughs> oh, she's an alumni. And she oh. is available for garlic tasting. Oh yes, by all means. Uh, yes, we we uh, we are not. Uh, we give away a lot of our food. Nice. Uh, the markets that we do are really for student experiences, um, but you know, so that they can get an idea when they have their own farms, mm -hmm. then they have at least had an, a market season, ideally. Right. Uh, but a lot of the food we give away, and uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to trial some of our uh, garlic. <laughs> At the end of the season, send me an email. It's ron.hutchison at stockton.edu. Uh, we'll and I can, that. I can give you a little socially distance uh, brown bag of garlic we'll, we'll in the do, fall. We'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a driveway drop off. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Meet you, meet you in a parking lot, exchange hands <laughs> through it. That's right. At, uh, at night, someplace sketchy, yeah. right? <laughs> a garlic driveway drop off. That's right. Sounds like a great name for an awful a, band. A great band, yeah. Uh, it looks like we've got some some squash. Yeah, we've got zucchini. some zucchini here. So we have uh, three different plantings of zucchini. As as any of you gardeners know, this was a really cold spring, so our zucchinis got really compressed. Okay. Our early our earliest planting died. We replanted, uh, and then in the rotation, we should have had a middle and a late zucchini. Uh, and our, it turns out our middle and our first are about the same. You can see our late over here which is about three weeks, four weeks after. Uh, it is still pretty small, uh, but man, they're, they're trying to put out some zooks, so that's great. Um, now, why, so I actually was just talking with Rob about this, these yellow ones that they're putting out. Yeah. These, these are like not edible. They're not, they're woody almost. Is that oh, the case? Uh, yeah, some of the older ones, but these are these are edible. Oh, those eating. are edible. Okay. Yeah, like that's a nice that's a nice one there, a nice size. Nice. Okay. Uh, this is either yellow fin or one of our other varieties. Yellow fin. Uh, this is um, something DiMaggio. It's an Italian heirloom variety. So we have some high yielding against some heirlooms. All right. That might be Dunja over there again, high yielding. Dunja, high, man, these high names are high great. Yield. I know. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and you guys planted all this stuff without. Well, where, without machinery? Well, without machinery, yeah, we don't use any machinery. Um, we, have a, we have a tractor that we use to mow. Uh, there and, she is, and that's that. the butte. Yeah, All right, listen, is, I gotta tell you, that thing is amazing. That helped, that helped you out, so we're, we're happy. <laughs> Lorianne asks, since students aren't around, do any of these crops go to a food bank? Yes, they, that's where they go now. We, uh, what was it, two days ago, I dropped off 350 pounds. A couple days before that was a 250 pound drop off. Saw him off. load up his, what do you have, a Prius? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw him load up his little electric car with so much food oh, weighing yeah. him down. They're like, where's your truck? And I'm like, it's right there. It's that compact car. We know that it, we don't, it, it's not going to be wasted. We, no, we put we, so much yeah. hard work into this, we're definitely not going to waste the food. We do and measure the quantity of all of it so we get yeah. that yield estimate. But. Yeah, it is all part of it. We're Right now, we're, we are at a, at a varietal level of keeping track of the data for that. Um, but we'd like to get into a into basically a bed by bed yield system. But that was the plan for this year. Obviously, it flew out the window when COVID <laughs> came in, and we're just trying to stay above. I'll also point out that many of these plants were planted by students 
in the agroecology eco program or students that were uh, worked at the farm. Yeah. You don't have to be in agroecology to work on the yeah, farm. Yeah, there's a lot of students who are just yeah. love farming, but maybe they're marine science, maybe yeah. they're the communications. And we there is uh, a lot of our graduates from last year are now working as farm managers or working on a farm. Some have their own farm. There's a lot of jobs for all of that, folks. I mean, there's really a lot, especially in yeah. New Jersey, where land is increasingly limited. Mm -hmm. um, people are trying to be more and more sustainable. And so, I mean, think from from something like this to something like, uh, what's that? What's the name of that um, that place? And is it Trenton that's growing stuff hydroponically up? Oh, yeah. That's a, yeah, you do have a solar power, basically. Yeah, container. I forget what it's called, but like yeah. some real experimental stuff. Yeah. So what are we staring at behind you? We got let's grapes. Go, let's go look at this. This is in your wheelhouse. Do you oh. want to give? You want to do a little plug for your course on on booze? I think I give a plug for my beverages class every oh, single time. Good. Give it again. So. <laughs> anyway, well, I I teach a, I teach a course called Beverages and Botany, which is when we're well and booze, where we talk about all the plants that go into making our beverages, and we spend two weeks talking about grapes and and wine. So here's our grapes. There you go. Um, so now that these is are from Justine's place. Yeah, right? yeah this okay. is uh, these are um, I think from her father maybe ultimately her grandfather so we have a, an italian champagne grape in here and uh you know a, they, it's called a conquered grape but it's probably just a red grape that was good for wine <laughs> and uh and it just got that name uh, it's probably not a true uh, so there's conquer. about i think there's about seven different actual species of grapes that can be grown in the united states um, but there's actually only one species of grape that makes wine, white wine as well as red wine, and that's Vitis vinifera. That's the species. All of the variety, all of the types like Merlot, Cabernet, all of those are just varieties of Vitis vinifera. However, the Concord grape um, and some of the other species of grapes can be mixed in yeah. with that. So, okay, now that's just my expertise. That's all. Yeah, I and I will say to add on to that too, there's a grape called the Norton. That the was Norton, I don't know the Norton, Norton grape was an interesting story behind it, but it was it was bred uh, by uh, a man named Norton in uh, the 1700s, uh, who was a colleague of uh, Jefferson's, um, and it is probably a European grape that accidentally outcrossed with a native grape, hmm. but it's one that can be grown organically, and that's our for our expansion. Our, we're going to get another trellis of Norton uh, hmm. down the other side, and so we can have these growing next to the. Now another grape. interesting part about grapes, just because I got a, I don't know, the root stock, the root stock of most grapes is not Venus vinifera. It's actually, do you know what species it is? It's the Native American grape. It's and the Native American grape, and the reason that we did this was because they had a huge, huge blight in Europe that killed off all of the native grapes in Europe. And the, it turns out that the Native American grape was resistant to that blight, to that pest. Uh, and so we started grafting the European grape of wines onto the American rootstock, and now all grapes have Native American grape rootstock. So the next time you see someone from Europe and they're talking about how great they're... Tell they're them it's wanted, from America. That's that root. The, the base of that is American. Let's, <laughs> speaking, of, uh, speaking of booze... Speaking of America, let's talk about John Deere. Oh, yeah, there's a John Deere back there. Um, so this is... Uh, so it turns out students like beer. Oh, um, who knew? Bad. Um, and this is our hop tower here. So these are uh, hops down here. This is the first year that we've transplanted them. We put the we installed the tower last fall, and uh, and so the first year we're just letting them grow on the ground. Although you can see this guy, uh, or this I'm sorry, this girl. They are uh, they They're are all female. female. They're all female. The yep. cones that we call hop cones are uh, uh, the female plant. In fact, what are the cones called? I forget what the cones are called. Uh, Oh, there's some called some fun. Yeah, they have some weird name. The uh, the uh, in fact, some places it's it's illegal to grow male hops because it, oh, yeah. it would pollinate the uh, the hops and make them. There's there's other things too that when they pollinate. It so this is really hops. Well. This is this is the stuff that makes your beer slightly bitter. Now, mm -hmm. if you're not used to thinking about beer as bitter. The reason that we put hops in there is because if we didn't, it would be so sweet you almost couldn't drink it. Mm -hmm. Because barley, which is the main ingredient in most beer, is so sweet that you have to balance it with bitter hops. What kind of variety is this? This one is uh, probably a Cascade. Cascade. We, yeah, Cascade. I think we have, um, I think we have uh, Magnum, Columbus, and Cascade. Magnum, Columbus, and Cascade. Cascade. No but nuggets? Uh, we'd like to get some. some nugget we, nectars. We, we gotta, we, we gotta start diversifying our so hops. This is my here. wheelhouse. So that's so awesome. Speaking of sweet beverages, 
here's our oh, orchard uh, oh, where man. we could make our, say, cider. Uh, <laughs> so, cider. Uh, I don't see I any apples. Might be a, your students in a few years might be a, uh, uh, might be a fixture at the farm for your yeah. class, so harvesting stuff and making it. So but, you guys just planted these. Yeah, this is, uh, this, these are, most of the apples were planted this year uh, in the spring. And the one, two, third row in, all the cherries were fall planted. We were able to get those in the fall. So it turns out you can plant them spring or fall. The last row is peaches. Uh, they were planted in the mm -hmm. spring as well. Mm -hmm. And some of these were from our, from two years ago planting. And some are uh, new this year. Peaches, so we have, apples. We have peaches, apples, uh, pears, uh, um, apricots. Apricots. Uh, and I'm missing another one. Uh, ch uh, cherries, I said. Oh, no, you didn't say cherries. Cherries. Peaches, yeah, cherries. apricots, apples, and, and pears. And pears and that's cherries, awesome. yeah. So we got, we got it all. So that's this area in here. And so we have we have a ways to go. we got to wait a few years, uh, and we'll get some of These are semi-dwarfs, so we made the call. Uh, some of those are dwarfs. See those planted closer together there? So they will start yielding earlier, but their maximum yield per plant won't, uh, won't be as big as a semi-dwarf okay. yield so but so, if you prune it right you can get a lot of produce yeah. out of it yeah you really got to keep up with the pro with the pruning because yep. with like with most crops if you force the energy to go towards the fruit by pruning the leaves away you can get higher yield but you really got to keep ahead of that this is one of our older apple trees here and this is an example because i'm always willing to call out our mistakes this is an example of terrible pruning here if <laughs> you look at it what happened what's, uh, what's, what's going on with the leaves we haven't uh we have probably cedar apple rust oh, uh, okay. but I, I haven't looked closely at it. oh we do have cedar apple rust i've seen the orange yeah. alien balls around yeah so um that's Probably I don't know. I'll, I'll take a look at it and see. But um, but anyway, this one this one we're we're not going to prune this year. We're going to let it put all the photosynthetic materials right. into the roots. You got to you got to give the tree something to work. And with. then next year we'll start. It'll be nice and healthy. We'll start. Um, we'll start going to town on it. Um, nice. Yeah. So how about uh, let's walk. How about hazelnuts? Hazelnuts. Let's talk about hazelnuts. Yeah. Oh, and then we'll look at the garlic drawing as well. If you like Nutella. Yeah. I love I love Nutella. My wife hates it. Oh really? She hates it. Oh. I don't understand. Huh. Well, I tell her she's just wrong. You wouldn't that way. Of course. Um, so uh, uh, some other things I'll point out to you is one of the things we do on, by the tractor over there. You'll see there's a pa uh, weedy patch over there. Uh, it's basically the uh, the grass. I won't say native grass because there's probably non-natives mixed in there too, but uh, but we keep that there. Um, basically, it serves as a control for what the soil would be. So if we ever wanted to compare our soil to okay. the native soil, we could do that. Nice. We also create habitat. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen tree frogs in in this little pond right here. Yeah. We we uh, sometimes when you're harvesting a, um, a a strawberry, you can find a, a gray tree frog. All right, sorry, folks. We back? Back yeah, we're back. Oh, we're okay. back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Yeah, so we find gray tree frogs in our strawberries over here. But the nice thing about this uh, aquatic habitat is that it should provide uh, moisture for for organisms, and the frogs are hopefully going out and eating our slugs and things like that. Yeah, and they do beneficial things. For so that's us. one of the really important things. So I actually study amphibians, and that's one of the really important reasons to keep frogs around is because they they do a huge amount of pest control for you. Yeah. So uh, that's one solution, actually. Uh, if you're if you're interested in in maintaining you know controlling pests, put yeah. a, put a little pond. Yeah. You're gonna make some mosquitoes, that's for sure. But the, you know what? Just put up a put up a citronella plant or something. The yeah. um, the mosquitoes yeah. are not going to eat your plants. Yeah, the mosquitoes are. Yeah, they're. They're just going to eat you. Yeah, and unfortunately, they're they're just here. So, um, uh, but uh, we also have some uh, um, some Asclepias for the butterflies when they come back in nice. here. Uh, some swamp milkweed here. Uh, some now, how have you? Goldenrod. How have you dealt with the? It's been really dry. Yeah, we've irrigated. So you've irrigated. Yeah, yeah. So I know that you guys are trying to go fully rainwater here, and that's why we have a, a water tower here. Yeah, but at this point, see, we're not at that yet. No, we're not at that. You can see those; they're all full now. We filled them with a mixture of rainwater and well water. But um, ideally, we will get we'll get there at some point. Um, we'd really like to show our students how to 
farm first, so we really expanded sure. beyond our water harvesting. When the farm was first, uh, when, when I first got here in 2016, we were able to do it with just that water tank there. And we would occasionally steal from the, ar we call it stealing from the arboretum, but. Um, By the way, that's, that's we, have a, we have an arboretum, which is a fancy word for a place where we hold specimen trees. We'll do a tour of that at some point, but yeah. anyways. Okay. I'll hold the camera for you then. <laughs> I'm not, I, I won't be able to identify right. half of those trees. Oh, okay, well you can hold it for, uh, we'll put that'll be good. Um, yeah, and this is our uh, wash, wash and pack area here. So when we're coming in, uh, we bring our produce here. We weigh everything on that scale there. We wash on this table. Uh, it's important to get the field heat. We call it field heat out of the vegetables. So we fill that trough up there, harvest them as quickly as possible, dunk them in uh, there, put them in boxes, and right. they so make they a trip spoil. over the cooler. Yep. Interesting. Um, and so students get to participate in all steps of, oh my gosh, of this, yes. from the, from this the planning not... to the growing to the packaging and the shipping, yeah. everything. Yeah, this is not for me, this is for them. So, well, I think you've student. taken home a few I, vegetables. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not, <laughs> not, not going to say that. But I mean, so did I. Yeah. We, we're, pretty, uh, we're pretty promiscuous with our vegetable giving away. So uh, we, have, uh, we have alumni that come by every now and then and say hi. And, and I'm like, fill it up. Yep. Take, it, take it away. Just as long as you weigh it. We definitely have a few people from Stockton that are still kind of working here uh, during, the, during COVID. And... Uh, I've heard tell that they just ride their bicycles up, grab a few bunches of uh, escarole and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, that's and... the, oh yeah, the uh, security department is apparently very much into escarole. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we aim to please. Uh, this is our, um, if you can see here, <coughs> to the right, We've this is our got garlic. Garlic, bag. we've got garlic. Yeah. So all of the, I don't know if you can get the label. You can see the, the blue tape on there indicates what variety it is and when it was harvested and what bed it came from. And so we need to dry it for about four weeks, then we trim it and we weigh each bulb of garlic. It gets put into a giant spreadsheet. We have uh, four years of data for that uh, garlic harvest and we are... Oh, hang on guys. Oh, they interrupted the garlic talk. Ah, oh, that's oh, I don't know about that. bad juju. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we have about uh, four years of data on this that various students have collected over time, nice. and uh, and we we mixed and this is one of your dominant areas. Ah, I love this. Yeah, uh, yeah so this, this is, is this great. is like yeah. something that you've been specializing. I've in. been specializing in. Uh, yeah, for that. For now the span is to dry things out. Yeah, yeah, to run by solar power, run by the solar panels over there. Uh, nice. Helps to dry it out when uh, today would be a great day for it, but some some of the cloudier, less humid days. We really want to keep airflow Just in keep there. Keep it going. Keep it we going. We don't get any mold. Nice. Here's another one of our good uh, varieties. This is a Korean variety, Pyongyang, that ended up with really uniform, large bulbs. Uh, and we have uh, we have a, a Korean faculty member who's uh, who's one of our best customers for <laughs> garlic. So I'm willing to go out of my way to to grow some. You certainly varieties. do have quite a bit of it here. Yeah. So um, I think last year it was 300 pounds. Is that I, pounds, if yeah. I understand? You're doing some DNA work on it. Uh, we'd like to breed uh, garlic, and that was going to be this year. It turns out garlic is, is really asexually reprodu reproducing, but there's been a uh, uh, the few people have managed to coax uh, flowers out of them so that they can be sexually reproducing. And so we planted the varieties this year that we can harvest garlic, true garlic seed from, not mm. just the cloves that you plant, the true seed. Uh, but again, that went out the window when COVID hit, sure. and we so many things. Uh, tragic. Yes. All right, now we got hazelnuts. 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 Here hazelnuts. we go. Let's move over um, to where it is, so we don't have to go through the fence. Yeah. So yeah, you can get up close there. It's um, this is the first year we picked these up last fall. It doesn't look like Nutella. It doesn't look like no, it doesn't at all. And uh, to be fair, these are the pollinators, so the, we'll get the uh, the true uh, disease resistant uh, varieties of Nutella. Actually, let me back up a little bit and say. That, um, that hazelnuts were grown on the East Coast, um, but on the West Coast, they're not, um, they don't have the disease pressure that they do here. Uh, so the industry moved to the West Coast. And so by having, by breeding resistant varieties, uh, we could, you know, Rutgers could move the industry back to the East Coast again, which would be so awesome. Now this is a drop in the bucket compared to, you know, this little area here uh, is, is not a big area, but uh, but it's something to show our students. Mm -hmm. um, We're know. not a huge, well, we are a huge campus, 
but we're not no, like, we're, stu student wise and faculty wise we're not enormous no so the fact that we even have this plot of land is is, is actually a really big selling point of stockton yeah and we um we are we have a laser-like focus on small-scale ag yeah and so that's what we want to keep it on the market garden approach and so you might have a few hazelnut trees that you would take them to the market um, and sell them as a value added and then maybe sit under them during the hot part of the summer or something nice. like that. So, uh, so we'll put in the, the named varieties uh, from Rutgers this fall, uh, let them grow up for a couple years, then take the fence down and, and start mowing. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Uh, well, all right. How much time do we have left? I don't know. I actually can't see the time on my phone. Okay. Uh, but uh, what's uh, what's what's planning on going in here? This is do we a. Want to talk um, about this? Yeah, this is a geothermal. So I mentioned uh, before that we are, we study carbon sequestration in the soil. We have a number of experiments on that. This all these tubes are buried at the four foot and two foot level, and we are going to make a geothermal greenhouse. Nice. So that greenhouse there will have uh, an exact replica. It'll be the uh, the experiment will be the geothermal and the control will be that one. So that one has insulating foam on the soil, much like this one will have, but it does not have the geothermal. The only variable, as we say in science, is the lack of geothermal in that one and the presence in this one. So we can do a direct comparison of crops that are grown in this geothermal system. And again, it will be powered by the solar array over here, built by the sustainable energy system. So the power that we need, so just for those of you that didn't watch the live stream last week, and I encourage you to do it, we have a YouTube channel now and you can always see it on the Facebook page, but we're essentially pumping water through these pipes to do a heat exchange between high versus low ground. And so that's where we need the electricity from is to pump that water between high and low to actually cool or heat things up. Yeah, exactly it. Except Maria we, says geothermal greenhouses like they have in Iceland, exactly the same. Well, not exactly. Not we're, exactly. We're not using water, we're using air. Oh, so okay. it'll be, it, it'll be, but everything you said, just substitute water for air. Okay. And we'll do air, we're pumping air through these. So our, our exchange medium isn't quite as good, but again, uh, the crops that we're growing, we're not going to be growing coffee and bananas. We're going to be growing crops that can handle cold weather. Yes. And they'll just be a little bit warmer and we'll get a little bit more yield. Nice, nice. Let's show you what this greenhouse that will be here hopefully by right. fall will look like. And then maybe we'll cut uh, it. And we'll meet, uh, we'll meet Rob. Yeah. Oh, is he? Where is he? Uh, probably somewhere in the vegetation. Oh, he's in uh, the greenhouse? It, unless he, uh, yeah. Oh. Hi, Rob. <laughs> yeah, he's in there. All right. So, so I think uh, this again, is the first one. Didn't you guys yeah. just start out with this? We started out with this. That was the first one there. That small one. I think Rob, his first week, got this one ready to go. Um, it's just like any hobby. And, you got to keep on getting bigger and, and bigger then, toys. And then we have that one there, the, the rolling, we call it the Rolling Thunder, or Linda is the name of the greenhouse. Linda is the mobile greenhouse. That was our, actually that was our, that was really our, well, Did it was our third it one. you name it Linda? Linda, yeah. You named it Linda. We all named it Linda. Linda, Linda. was a, a really valued professor in biology and gave the money to purchase that greenhouse. Um, and then this is our control greenhouse here. Here's uh, Rob. Guys, I know you can't smell this, but it oh, just it smells, smells tomato. It's mm. what, what's it? What's the what's it? The uh, nightshade. Yeah. Like yeah. Oh, look at that. Man, look at that. So Rob is responsible for a lot of the success of the farm. Uh, Thanks, Rob. Yeah. No, he's he's the man. No, he is. Yeah, he is. I'll agree yeah. with him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's responsible for most of the farm. Yeah. What do you do? Do you I, even do anything here? Uh, I just I just slack <laughs> off and, and talk to people like you, and then Rob does all the work. Like this is it's like it's like four days a week. Right? I know it's, it's like, like yeah people. yeah talking to people <laughs> yeah no that's that's so yeah. this is all tomatoes and we got some eggplants eggplants growing on here. Look at those flowers, beautiful. And then are they bolted, are, yes. So, the, the eggplants they look like uh, they're they don't they don't really bolt, but they're they're just growing like weeds right. now, so they're doing great. Uh, again, same same thing we talked about before. We got uh, cukes. Cukes, yep. Got some cukes. Uh, so eating, uh, pickling, smaller variety here. Pickling. Yeah. We've already, just, this is our first year of really, really going to town, growing. We've grown to the greenhouse and we now, we kind of know what variety we want to grow now. <laughs> right, Rob? Yeah, but I 
idea. We have an idea. It's uh, some success versus others. It's just so much easier to, to prune and keep track of, and it's. Uh, now you see all this stuff on the ground that we've been pruning. You know what it's gonna do? Straight to compost, guys. Yep. Straight to compost. Don't waste it. It's good yeah. stuff. <laughs> what? As soon as we had time. If we had a student, it would be in the compost pile. But we'll, we'll get to it eventually. Yeah, yeah, just break it. Uh, different varieties. So one heirloom, uh, Cherokee purple, uh, and then uh, Martha Washington. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Come up with these names. Lemon Sorry, right? That's it? Yeah. Apparently, I don't know. Oh, um, and Lemon Boy. Which is a great name too. So lemon. This is a lemon boy. Lemon boy. This was picked out by one of our uh, uh, our uh, students um, and, his, and his partner, total valued member of the uh, of the farm nice. farm community last year at the Stockton Farm. So um, yeah. Picked out solely because of the name. Solely because of the name. That's fine. Uh, one of the classes I teach, uh, um, plants and agroecology, uh, you, the the money that we make from a plant sale that we have the year before gives the students the opportunity to pick out any seed they want within reason uh, for the next growing season. So the students can go crazy and pick out any seed they want, and then we sell it to the community and faculty members and things like that. Okay, and then but that I mean, money... I'd rather buy a six pack of beer <laughs> than six pack of plants. Ah. No, I meant beer. <laughs> you want beer, and not plants. So, okay. Jeez. All right. Well, I think that we are yeah. just about done here. So um, I'll just give one more shout out to the sustainability program. They're doing a really great job. Um, and I know that even even with um, COVID still kind of going um, and being a problem right now, I know that, that they're working really hard to bring quality education for uh, the students next next semester. Fortunately, you know, we're, we're it's the summer slash fall semester. So uh, we can do a lot of stuff outdoors and properly social distance, and we can still get people to, to you know, at least be a little hands-on, yeah? Yeah, it yeah. should be good. I'm planning on teaching. I'm going to take advantage of the COVID pandemic. I don't know if take advantage is the right word, but um, this fall my classes are going to be taught outside yeah. at the farm for, as, for as much as much as possible to yeah. still to get hands students. Yeah, hands-on stuff. That's the, that's the motto of the sustainability program. We're just... Get out there and do it. So, guys, uh, thank you for joining me. Next week, um, if you uh, care to, we are probably, with any due luck, we're going to be with the Margate Terrapin, Diamondback Terrapin Project, looking at some Diamondback Terrapin Road Rescue. If the weather doesn't hold out for that, then I'll probably do a canoe ride. Um, but in either case, it should be a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, once again, thank you all for showing up, and I appreciate it. Talk yep. to you later. Thank you for listening. Yep.